All right. Well, welcome to Saints Rest Reformed Church. It is so good to see some new faces. Bailey, so glad you're here with us today. Very exciting for our church. New faces. We just uh, hope and pray that will continue. Um, we are honored for everybody that is here. We are a historically reformed confessional Baptist church plant. And our goal and our focus is to provide gospel clarity and rest in Christ for you, for, for weary saints. So um, before we get started, as always, we want to invite any friends and family that are in need of rest or prayer. Please find one of us at the end of the service. And we would love, we would be delighted to pray for you and with you. And uh, we may we may ask y'all for prayer one of these days. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, for sure, I would. Uh, in front of me is a QR code. That is the key to following along step by step with the liturgy and the, the service today. So please, if, you, if you've got a smartphone and um, you want to pull that out, go ahead and scan, scan the QR code. Uh, the last thing I will say is um, if you're able, please stand and join us for the call to worship. To all who are weary and need rest, to all who mourn and long for comfort, to all who feel worthless and fail, to all who sin and need a Savior, Jesus says, come. Listen as our gentle shepherd calls us to worship from Psalm 47. Oh, clap your hands, all peoples. Shout to God with the voice of joy. For the Lord Most High is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. He subdues peoples under us as nations and nations under our feet. He chooses our inheritance for us, the glory of Jacob whom he loves, Selah. God has ascended with a shout. The Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our king. Sing praises. For God is the king of all the earth. Sing praises with a skillful psalm. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. The princes of the people have assembled themselves as the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So let's lift our voices now in prayer. Father, thank you so much for uh, the saints gathered here, God, for this opportunity to come together in the name of Christ. So Lord, in response to your call to worship, God, we, we respond with adoration to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray that you would bless today's gathering. God, we pray that... Uh, as we gather here and rest in Christ, that, uh, that you would receive us in him, Lord, in his name. That you would gather here with us as we worship. That you would deepen our reliance on Jesus together, God, to, uh, to stop striving for, the approve, for approval from you and to rest in the approval we already have, God, in Christ. Lord, our eyes have been turned inward this week in so many different ways. Lord, we ask that in your mercy you would turn them outward to you, to our King, to the one who has us in the palm of his hand. Lord, who has provided all the righteousness we need in the forgiveness of sins. God, we pray that you would make us fruitful in him all through uh, this gathering, Lord, as we gather here under your word. Lord, we pray that you would be glorified as we receive Christ in all his sufficiency. Lord, to the glory of your redeeming love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Lord, we lift our voices as one to praise your name, saying, Glory, glory be to the, the Father, Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, Spirit as it was in the beginning, beginning is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. So as we, as we sing now, let's instruct one another in the glories of our God. Thank you. 
Y'all may be seated. In scripture, we hear two distinct voices speaking to us, the law and the gospel. We hear the voice of the law in all 66 books of the Bible, and it tells us what God requires of us to be counted as righteous. The righteousness that the law requires is perfect love toward neighbor and God in every thought, word, and deed, every moment of every day of our lives. That absolute standard magnifies God's purity, even as it's revealing our impurity, and it compels us to re-rest ourselves in the righteousness of God that is apart from the law, the righteousness of Christ that's credited to us through faith. Let's now turn our ears to hear God's law and let it remind us that Christ is our only plea before the Father. Listen carefully to the third commandment from Exodus chapter 20, verse 7, and hear the law of the Lord. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. From the beginning until this very day, Jesus has built his church through the Spirit's illumination of his word. The voices of the law and the gospel have reverberated from generation to generation, only growing in clarity from one era until the next. And the Heidelberg Catechism is part of that tradition of clarity. Coming to its teaching on the law, it represents the culmination of over 1,500 years of clarity within the church. So let's study the word with the church and look at the Heidelberg Catechism, questions number 99 and 100, to consider the moral law. Question number 99, what is required in the third commandment? That we must not, by cursing or by false swearing, nor yet by unnecessary oaths, profane the abuse in the name of God, nor even by our silence and connivance be partakers of these horrible sins and others, and in some that we use the holy name of God in no other way than with fear and reverence, so that he may be rightly confessed and worshipped by us, and be glorified in all our words and works. And question number 100. Is the profaning of God's name by swearing and cursing so grievous a sin that his wrath is kindled against those who do not help as much as they can to hinder and forbid the same? Yes, truly, for no sin is greater and more provoking to God than the profaning of his name. Wherefore, he even commanded it to be punished with death. So understanding that God's law requires that we truly fear and treat God as holy and love him with our entire being, our unrighteousness is now exposed. So let's draw near to the throne of grace and confess these sins. Almighty Father, in light of our salvation in Christ, we ask you to have mercy on us and forgive our sins. Renew us through your spirit and lead us to put sin to death and live holy lives. Amen. If you'd stand again as we continue this confession and song.
praise God that the voice of the law is not the only one that speaks to us in God's word. Just as God tells us what we must do to be counted righteous, he also tells us what he's done to provide all the righteousness we need in his son. After hearing the law and confessing our sins, we turn now to see the Lamb of God who's taken away our sins, the mediator between us and the Father, to be reminded of the righteousness and the forgiveness of sins that we have in Him. Please remain standing for the reading of the Gospel from Colossians 1, 21-23. Hear the voice of the law. Sorry, the gospel. Hear the voice of the gospel. (laughs) And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach, if indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. Do you believe this good news? That Christ has taken us in the middle of our hostility against God and has reconciled us with the Father through his death so that in him we are holy and blameless and beyond reproach. We believe. And saints, it is my joy to declare that just as God has spoken to you in Colossians 1, the hope of Paul's gospel will not fail you. We are gathered here to continue in this faith as one, firmly established, steadfast, not moving away from it. And as we look to Christ And keep looking to Christ. Listen to God's word to you. You have been reconciled to our Father. You are holy and blameless and beyond reproach in Jesus Christ. Your sins are forgiven. And you stand righteous in the Son. Let's continue to instruct one another in this wonderful gospel as we sing.
Please be seated. What a beautiful song. Just as we heard leading into the catechism earlier, we studied God's word with the church. The Apostles' Creed represents the church's summary of the most important teachings of Scripture. As we join our voices with the church from every era, we understand ourselves to be part of the one universal Catholic body of Christ. From the beginning to this day, we confess the truth of Scripture together as one. So please join me as we confess our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the Creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day He arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, whence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Please join me in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for yet another opportunity to join together and worship you and receive so many blessings and gifts from you, Lord. We thank you for your promises to 
use these ordinary gathering, ordinary means uh, to grow us in you and to bear fruit in us. I pray that you would continue to prepare those of us that are looking to plant this church, Lord. Prepare us to uh, live in ways that would honor you and that would show others your, your steadfast love, Lord. Uh, I pray for guests that come here. Help us to know how to love them well. Help us know how to uh, minister to them in the ways that they need. Uh, and want to pray that you would just help us to show them the law and the gospel. Um, help them to see that salvation cannot be found anywhere but in you alone, Lord. Pray for um, the saints that have been gathering with us for a long time and just all the needs that they may have. We specifically pray for Reagan and Amy's moms as they're continuing to heal. Just continue to do that work in their lives, Lord. Um, and just give us grace as we go out to the world each week and look to live lives that honor you, God. Uh, just help us in that endeavor because we cannot do it on our own. Uh, pray for those in authority over us, Lord, here in Midland locally and nationally. Just pray that you would uh, provide justice. Uh, help us to be uh, rested in the fact that you are in control of everything, Lord. In your precious and heavenly name I pray. Amen. Amen. If you would, please turn in your Bibles to John chapter 17, verses 1 and 2, and we'll take a look at the sermon text for today. And it says, Jesus spoke these things, and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. Yeah, so I don't know if I announced it beforehand. I think I told maybe the Harpers, uh, but that wasn't a psalm he just read from. So we are <laughs> moving into another uh, series. Uh, we plan to take the next seven weeks and uh, look at aspects of the church. Uh, I figure as we're uh, moving toward uh, planting as a church, it's a good thing to cover, right? Let's understand the church. Let's understand what she is and what she does. So let's pray before we get started. Father, thank you for these saints. Thank you for this gathering, Lord. Uh, we thank you for your word, God, and the truth that you've revealed to us. God, we pray that you would bless the preaching of your word now, Lord, and the hearing of your word. Uh, we pray that you would teach us in the inner man, God, according to your truth. Now, as we, as we turn our ears and our hearts and our minds and our attention spans and with everything, every faculty you've given us, God, may it be uh, applied now, God, to uh, hearing and, and understanding and receiving your word, God. We pray that you would uh, bear much fruit, God, through that as we do now. In Christ's name, amen. So this series is actually one that I preached through before uh, when we were there in Andrews, and I've called it the King's Feast. And so uh, each of these sermons kind of begins with an illustration that builds from week to week and uh, I at least as far as my understanding it, it helps me to really visualize some of the concepts that we are looking at throughout this series and so uh, so getting into this we're going to imagine that we are a peasant living some six or seven hundred years ago uh, in medieval Europe maybe and we're working the king's land just scratching out a living, you know, under those rough conditions. So one day we imagine an emissary comes from the king and he approaches you in the field and he hands you a beautiful set of clothes and he tells you that you have been invited to a feast in the king's palace. And so you, as this peasant, go home, clean up best you can, you get dressed in the, the robe that he brought you, and you go to the palace. And so once you're seated at the feast, the king informs you that all of your debts have been forgiven. 
And that not only that, he is adopting you into the royal family. He tells you that the purpose of this feast is for him to explain all these wonderful gifts that he's given to you and to prepare you for the honorable duties you'll carry out in his name and as royalty. And so, as, yeah, so over the course of this feast, that's what the king tells you he's intending to do. So would you, in that situation, be eager to sit at the table enjoying the feast that he's set before you and hearing all these wonderful things or would you take a plate of food and leave? Yeah, I mean, thanks for the food, but yeah, no thanks. It's, of course, a silly question. No one in their right mind would neglect the kind wishes of this king who's given you such honor. The gathering of the local church is an even better feast with even better promises than the imaginary ones in our story. Scripture attaches unfathomable significance to the Lord's Day gathering and unimaginable promises. And if we fail to recognize the centrality of this gathering, we can come close to resembling that peasant who took the food and left. Our gospel declares that God himself assumed flesh, that he fulfilled all righteousness in our place, that he gave his life to satisfy the curse of our unrighteousness, that he rose again, that he ascended to the glory above, and that he was crowned for our salvation. Also that in his grace, he might give us everything he earned as a gift through faith. So our king has used his authority, this authority bestowed on the God-man. He has used it to establish and empower his people as his church. And the gathering of the church is the, the vehicle that he ordinarily uses to provide and to fulfill his kind promises towards us. As we move toward covenanting as a church, we must be careful to pay close attention to what Scripture says a local church is and does. We need that foundation of truth so that we can consciously launch with the emphasis Christ himself places on the church. We don't want to be those who receive the gifts of the gracious king, but fail to make use of the feast in the way that he's provided it. So in order to understand the mind of Christ for his church, and therefore to plant biblically, we need to consider scripture as a whole to get the big picture. So let's start by, again, considering the passage Cameron read as our uh, launching passage this morning. John 17, 1 to 2. Jesus spoke these things, and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. So Jesus proclaims that once he fully accomplished the will of the Father, he was crowned king of all creation true man and true God, the mediator was crowned king of all things. And he's been given in a special sense as the head of his church. He's been crowned for our salvation. It's what his lordship over his church means. It's, uh, he's, he wields his authority to bring the plan to pass of our being glorified in him. He rules and reigns over heaven and earth to bring the salvation of his church to completion. So as we consider the church, there are two senses in which scripture refers to the church. The invisible or the universal church and the visible church. The invisible church refers to the entirety of Christ's love gift from the Father. It's every man, woman, and child from the moment of the fall to the final trumpet 
It's his elect, those who have been, are, or will be saved through faith in Christ. That's the invisible church. Another way to think of the invisible church is to fast forward all the way to the end. Right? In the age to come, when we're all gathered around Christ's throne in the new heavens and the new earth, everyone you see there are the invisible church here and now. In Hebrews 12, 23, the author refers to this invisible church as the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. We call it the invisible church because we cannot see the saving work of God that brings that eternal assembly to Christ. It is invisible to us. We can see the evidence of those who belong to the invisible church beginning with their professed agreement with law and gospel, right? But we can't infallibly see into everyone's hearts. Jesus told Peter in Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church. So Jesus first builds his church by calling sinners, by his grace, uniting them to himself through faith and adding them to his invisible church declaring them eternally righteous, forgiving all their sins in his person and work on their behalf. But those that he adds to the invisible church, he also calls to join together into the visible church. Those who prof profess agreement with God's law and gospel, who agree with God in his diagnosis of their sinfulness and are therefore siding with him against their sinfulness and who are relying on his way of salvation in Christ they're what we call visible saints and those visible saints are baptized in accordance with their profession of faith and something incredible is happening in that baptism the waters of baptism are as it were taken up out of the pages of scripture and brought into the physical world and we understand them to be a sermon preached by God himself. God is preaching over them in their baptism in that water. God himself is declaring for all to see and for them to experience, this person has been united with Christ, buried with him, and raised to walk in newness of life. They have already passed through the judgment of God in Christ. And as surely as the dirt is washed away from their bodies, so their sins have been washed away. It's a public sermon God preaches over individuals in our seeing, in our, in our midst. And so we treat them according to God's public declaration in the church. They are visible saints and we have warrant from God himself to consider baptized believers to be invisible saints. You know, baptized uh, upon profession of faith. You know, There are probably groups that you know, there might not be a lot of meaning behind the baptism, so I'm not saying uh, within our body, right? <laughs> but we can say that for sure. Uh, the baptized saints are treated as such. And so Paul addressed the local gathering of the visible saints in the visible church in Rome. He called them beloved of God, called as saints. So that all over the place, the apostles, how do they speak to the visible church when they're writing to them? They speak to them as saints. They call them the beloved of God, his children. So visible saints make up the visible church. They're the brothers and sisters that we gather with to grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ in the local church. The ones we're called to love and to serve and to cling to as we walk together to glory through all of our sin and suffering and joy and rejoicing. So we understand that Christ as head and king of the church wields his authority to give eternal life to those the Father's given him. We understand that the full and final nature of this church is invisible to us. 
but that Christ gathers his invisible church into visible expressions on the basis of individual's agreement with law and gospel. And he owns their profession of faith through baptism and seals them in that way. And so understanding all that, uh, the scripture reveals four main ways that Christ then uses his kingly authority, his headship over his church, uh, to establish and guide and empower his church. The four ways he calls his church, he institutes his church, he orders his church, and he governs his church. So this sermon is a, a flyby of all of this. We'll consider all of this in, in more and more detail as, as we go by, but this is kind of the, the, the bird's eye view of all of this. But let's start by considering Christ's authority to call his church. In 1 Timothy 1.15, Paul says, It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. As we hear in detail throughout Scripture, in the eternal counsel of God, the Father gave the church as a love gift to the Son. But every son and daughter of Adam falls short of the glory of God. None of us possesses the righteousness that God requires to have fellowship with him. God cannot approve of us in and of ourselves. And so the triune God's plan of redemption was for the Son to assume flesh, to be born into his own fallen creation, born of a woman, born under the law, a true man like us in every way, tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. And in his life, Christ accomplished righteousness. As the Father testified, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The approval that we cannot have, Christ gained. Christ alone is well pleasing to the Father. And the gospel is that all Christ accomplished in his perfect life he accomplished in our place. We, the wicked, who receive and rest in Christ, are beloved sons and daughters, well-pleasing to the Father in Christ. But the approval of righteousness isn't our only need. God in his justice must punish all unrighteousness. The curse of his law must be satisfied. And so the perfect Lamb of God was punished in the place of all who believe. Christ fully satisfied the curse of the law, which belongs to all lawbreakers. Christ was punished in our place. Our sin was counted as his sin, though he had no sin of his own. And the death that he died bearing our sin counted as our death, the death we owe. Just as his death read the verdict, curse satisfied. So his resurrection, three days later, read the verdict, justified. Declared righteous for all in him. For every man, woman, and child who receives and rests in Christ as their entire righteousness and as the full satisfaction for their guilt, the Spirit unites us to Jesus such that everything he earned, all that he deserves, becomes ours. That's good news. This was the plan of the triune God before time began again, to accomplish the gathering of this love gift of the Father to the Son. In his grace and in his mercy, Jesus holds out his hands through the preaching of his gospel and calls all sinners to come to him and rest to enter his covenant of grace through faith, to be united to him as their covenantal head, to hear the Father declare them righteous in the righteousness of Christ, and to receive the forgiveness of sins in him. But his elect hear and know his voice in a different way. John 10, 11, and then 14 to 16 
Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me. Even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep, which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice. And they will become one flock with one shepherd. Christ calls his flock. He uses his authority as crown king of all creation to call his flock. It's his voice in the gospel proclaimed by the preachers that he sends. It's his voice that's that's going forth and his sheep here and gathering to the fold. Christ gathers his invisible church to himself, and then he gathers that invisible church into visible local bodies to rest in him and to obey together. And so Jesus uses authority to call his church himself. The second way he uses it is to institute the local visible gathering of believers. We see this institution in Matthew 28, 18 to 20. It says, And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So our king has been given all authority, as he begins by saying, And he sends preachers into the physical world to preach his gospel, to baptize disciples, and to gather them together to grow in unity under his word and at his table. And he promises that his presence is with us as we gather. This is the institution of the local church. We see him instituted right there. After the Spirit came on Pentecost... And Peter preached the first gospel sermon after the Savior's work was finished. We read how the Spirit gathered those who believed into the first visible body as Christ had instituted. It's in Acts 2, 41 to 42. It says, So then those who had received his word were baptized. And that day there were added about 3,000 souls. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, and to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. So those whom Christ calls willingly gather themselves together with others whom Christ has called to be fed the word, to pray, and to fellowship. And that gathering which Christ instituted and and brought together by the power of the Spirit has continued to this day. This willing gathering of the saints is the context in which all the promises of Christ are ordinarily fulfilled toward his people. It's where we come together to receive Christ's gifts, to grow in dependence on him and his grace, and to learn to obey in gratitude. It's to such local gatherings that most of the New Testament is written. The local church is Jesus' idea. He instituted it. But he doesn't just call and gather people into the church he instituted. The third, the third way, he also uses his authority to order the visible church, visible body. Christ has revealed in his word everything we need to order the local church according to his mind and to fully carry out our purpose. Matthew 16, 18 to 19, it's a familiar passage. You might have heard Roman Catholics use it to argue for the papacy. Uh, Of course, we would believe that's a very wicked reading of this passage and not true. Uh, But Romans 18, 18 to 19. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. 
And so we, we actually just saw the result of these keys that Christ gives Peter. We just read it a while ago. Jesus tells Peter he's giving him the keys to the kingdom. And then he tells him that he's going to build his church upon him. And then what do we see Peter do? Just a few chapters later in Acts 2, the Spirit descends on the gathered disciples. Peter stands in the assembly. He preaches the gospel of Christ and flings the gates of heaven open. Gates that haven't been shut ever since. The people of God have come in through Christ from that action ever since. And, and it, by the same means ever since. Peter used the key, the keys by proclaiming Christ. And the gates of heaven were opened through his preaching. The Spirit called men and women to Christ through that message and gathered them into a local body where they sat under the apostles' teaching, prayed, and fellowship. So every believer since that day has entered through the gate that Peter opened. And the same keys, again, are still used to this very day in every true church. Christ has entrusted the local church with the task of proclaiming the same message Peter proclaimed using the same keys. And that message is still the keys that opens the gate of heaven to sinners. And again, don't miss that. This That happens in the local church. We use the keys to open heaven to sinners. And we then have the responsibility to hear their professed profession of agreement with law and gospel, the profession of faith, to baptize them, to add them to the visible church. And so the keys of the kingdom are for addition, but they're also for subtraction. Jesus calls his church to close the gates to those who would harm the visible church. Matthew 18, 15 to 20, he says, If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. So did you pick up on the phrase, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. That's the exact and very unique phrase that Jesus used to describe the keys when he gave them to Peter. So just as Jesus entrusts the church with the keys to add to the visible body, so he instructs them to use the same keys to remove from the body when the unity or purity of the body is in danger. So the ministry of the keys is Jesus bringing order to his church. By giving the keys, Christ delegates his authority to the body to act on his behalf. That's why he says, I'm there with you in your midst when you're doing this hard thing. So he delegates his authority according to his word to add and to subtract. He's revealed his mind concerning these things. And he gives us everything we need to fully accomplish his pur purposes in this. So again, we're going to look more closely at all this in the weeks to come. But we've seen the power of Christ to call, institute, and order his church. And now we'll see his power to govern his church. When we consider the church's responsibility to restore those who are stumbling or to put them out of the membership if they refuse to be restored, that's an enormous responsibility. The final step of that process, if you remember, is tell it to the church. And the local church herself is therefore called to 
decide the case according to the word and presence of Christ in the local body. So again, the congregation herself has been invested with the power of the keys, with the authority that she needs to carry out the will of Christ in the church. But it's also the mind of Christ that the church use her authority to call officers to carry out the tasks that the word gives them in the word. This is in part how Christ governs his church. Christ appoints, Christ appoints pastors and deacons in his church by gifting and calling them. And he qualifies them by making his grace evident in these individuals. So the church is called to respond to the work of Christ in gifted individuals to then use her authority to affirm and call those whom Christ has equipped, whom he's appointed, whom he's gifted to the body to fill that office. Paul, speaking of the pastors at Ephesus, he said this in Acts 20, 28, Be on your guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. So the Spirit himself gives pastors to local churches, and he charges them by his word to carry out the ministry of the word, to shepherd the congregation, as the congregation willingly consents to their service in the office. So deacons are also given by the Lord and are empowered by the church to ensure that it runs smoothly and that no one's material needs are neglected. Local church has been entrusted with Christ's authority to operate as he's revealed. And the church authorizes the officers that Christ gives to carry out these tasks on their behalf. The tasks that Christ gives in his words, his word. So with the church called and instituted and ordered and governed all under the authority of Christ according to his mind, what's the result? What's the purpose of all of this? What does it do? What does he do, rather, through all of this? The book of Ephesians was largely written to answer that question. Paul begins this book with a, a wonderful summary of the grace of God in Christ. He tells the local church that they've been given every spiritual blessing in Christ now and for all eternity. How this gift of grace that Christ brought was planned before the foundation of the world and was brought to bear through his life and through his redeeming blood. Paul prays that this local body would grow in their understanding of all that they have in Christ, that Christ himself would fill them, that they'd understand the infinite, incomprehensible love of Christ, and that out of that love received, under the ministry of the word in the church at Ephesus, that they'd grow in all love, unity, patience, humility, gentleness, and peace. That's the result of the ministry of a biblical local church. And how's it accomplished? Through Christ's gift in the local gathering through his calling, instituting, ordering, and governing his local body. Here's how Paul describes it. Ephesians 4, 11 to 16. And he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children, tossed here and there by waves, and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. So 
The Lord has established his church for this purpose. And as we're obedient to function as he's shown us, all the wonderful things he's promised will be brought to bear. Will be a visible outpost of the kingdom of God. A place where the people of God cling to Christ together and love one another. And where the world finds the gates of heaven opened wide to them as Christ calls them through his gospel. So again, as we move toward planting as a church, the plan is to focus in on some of these elements over the weeks to come to see the mind of Christ according to his word so that we can launch as, consciously launch as with these things in view. And so that we can expect to see his precious work in us and through us in Midland. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your church. God, thank you for placing the great high priest over us, our king as the head of the church. Thank you for your infinite wisdom in all that you've revealed for the function of the body. Lord, teach us and lead us and protect us. Give us the grace that we need to plant saints rest as a local body according to your mind lord be pleased to accomplish every wonderful thing that you've designed the church to be and do god in this body we pray let your kingdom come and your will be done in midland as it is in heaven in christ's name we pray amen so praise God, we're rapidly approaching the, the time when we can have the, the second part of the, the means of grace, the means of his sustaining us and growing us and confirming us and deepening us in the faith as we meet with Christ around his table through the sacrament. But until that time, until we become a, a full church, let's continue our tradition we've kind of had of singing this hymn uh, as we look forward to that time. Yeah, stand.
word of the Lord reveals to us our salvation. And the security of this salvation is as unchanging as God is himself. His covenants are not forgotten, and his throne is eternal. Although we are still in a fallen world, our hope is in that eternal God and his promise to return. The pain of sin and death will be no more. He will wipe away all of our tears, and he will make all things new. So as we turn our eyes back to this present age, let's adjourn with the reminder that he is coming soon. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty, come. Let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming quickly. Amen. Amen. Come, Come, Lord Jesus. Jesus. We have delivered to you, as of first importance, what we also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Now, now Lord, Lord, you are releasing your bondservants to depart in peace according to your word, for our eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles, and the glory of your people, Israel. Hear God's benediction from Romans chapter 15, verse 13, and depart in peace. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.